In Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39, Jesus takes a look at how the days of Noah would be a picture of how things would be at the end of time. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. He speaks of how they were carrying on their daily activities, uh, marrying and giving in marriage, eating and drinking, and, and they weren't paying attention, and they didn't know that the flood was going to come, despite 120 years of preaching. So shall it be, he says, in the, day, in the coming of the Son of Man. History is repeating itself. I'm sure the Lord looks down from heaven now. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. And we're seeing that in the world today, that the violence in the land, the selfishness, the self-worship that's out there. And I, I think it just is breaking the heart of God. Perhaps the single most important practical lesson to try and find the present day application for is what does it mean to get on the ark? <laughs> we are living in the judgment hour. We're living in a final twilight in the world's history where we're standing on the threshold of eternity. And people need to realize these are awesome times, more so than any other time in history, because the sun is really going down on the world's probation. And now is the time when people need to prepare to meet their God. <laughs> What happened before the flood is going to happen again right before the second coming of Christ. Those who don't have a perspective, who aren't looking at the scriptural message, they'll go on just as they, as they do with the circumstances of life, and they won't see the end coming. I'm Jeff Rich, Director of Lehman Ministries. What you're about to witness will be unlike anything that you've ever seen before. Not only are we going to investigate the flood story, but we'll trace the roots of evolution and show how it's influenced Western society. And most importantly, we'll take a look at how the story of Noah helps explain the pages of Bible prophecy. This is the story of Noah and the flood like you've never seen before. Today many Christians are anticipating the future coming of Christ and they're wondering what's in store for planet Earth. They'd do well if they went back and they read a story of Noah and the Flood because within that epic story of the Bible, there's more of the future revealed to us than many know. In fact, the evidences are all around us. love. His nature, his law, is love. It ever has been, it ever will be. Every part of creation, from the tiniest insect that floats in the sunbeams to vast galaxies in the far reaches of space, all are an expression of his unsearchable love.
There's no doubt whatsoever that the world before the flood spoke about the love of God. Everything was absolutely beautiful. His love was expressed in, in anything and everything that you wanted to look at. From the smallest single cell life form to the most complex being in that of Adam that he had created, everything was perfect. If we could be transported back to find out what was the world like before the flood, you really need to think almost about it was like a different planet. They were surrounded by an abundance of, um, of food. There was an abundance of, of beauty in nature. The mountains were not jagged and rough and uh, forbidding and dangerous like we see today. They were majestic and tall and rolling and covered with fresh topsoil and, and every kind of flower that you can imagine. Many of uh, uh, the animals and plants are extinct today. There was no extreme colds, no extreme hot, no extreme dryness, no extreme weather. And we didn't have the horrific storms that we have now. Uh, and the trees were covered with vines and, and the little tendrils were wrapped around all in perfect order, just laid with fruit. Uh, it mentions in Genesis how the water came up as a mist came up and watered the, uh, watered the land. The earth was watered by uh, like an automatic sprinkler system. The mist came up from the earth according to Genesis chapter 2. Rain was unknown. Gems and gold and silver were just abundant on the surface of the ground. Here you have this paradise, if you will, that was in many respects this perfect biosphere that would allow humans and animals to flourish. The life expectancy of the people, of course, being very long, according to the biblical record. When God makes it, he says it's good, good, very good. And it was in the face of all that beauty that man sinned. He was really without excuse because God had provided everything he needed. Everything was in harmony and everything was uh, perfect. It's obvious when we look around us that we do not live in a perfect world. In fact, this planet is really not even very friendly towards human habitation. When you consider that over 70% of the Earth is covered with water, add to that the fact that there are cold, barren waste places, vast deserts, mountain chains. Well, either this planet's always been like this, or something happened that fundamentally changed the surface of the whole Earth. What happened at the flood totally changed the geography of the world. These little tiny bits of nature that are broken, that reveal to us the true horror of sin. And what we're seeing in our world is the consequence of that. Men began to try to find happiness through selfishness and through sinfulness and wickedness. But God is so loving. He said, there's still people down there I can save. I want to save as many as I can. I'm going to give them a warning. If they have any threads of redeemable qualities left and they reach out, I'll save them. And so he created this ark. He created a, a vehicle through which they might be saved and Noah, a messenger through which they might learn. God is warning us. God gives us prophetic insights for us to turn from them. It would be disastrous just as it was for those in Noah's day. The story of Noah and the Flood are in many ways a literal demonstration of Revelation's prophecies. So come with us now as we open the prophecies of Revelation by going back to the days of Noah. of Noah there were evident tokens of decay but the earth was still rich and beautiful in the gifts of God's providence the hills were crowned with majestic trees supporting the fruit laden branches of the vine the vast garden like plains were clothed with verdure and sweet with the fragrance of a thousand flowers the fruits of the earth were in great variety and almost without limit the trees far surpassed in size, beauty, and perfect proportion, any now to be found. Their wood was of fine grain and hard substance, closely resembling stone and hardly less enduring. Gold, silver, and precious stones existed in abundance. 
The human race yet retained much of its early vigor, but a few generations had passed since Adam had access to the tree which was to prolong life, and man's existence was still measured by centuries. Had that long-lived people, with their rare powers to plan and execute, devoted themselves to the service of God, they would have made their Creator's name a praise in the earth and would have answered the purpose for which He gave them life. But they failed to do this. There were many giants, men of great stature and strength, renowned for wisdom, skillful in devising the most cunning and wonderful works, but their guilt to giving loose rein to iniquity was in proportion to their skill and mental ability. God bestowed upon these antediluvians many and rich gifts, but they used his bounties to glorify themselves and turned them into a curse by fixing their affections upon the gifts instead of the giver. They employed the gold and silver, the precious stones, and the choice wood in the construction of habitations for themselves and endeavored to excel one another in beautifying their dwellings with the most skillful workmanship. They sought only to gratify the desires of their own proud hearts and reveled in scenes of pleasure and wickedness. Not desiring to retain God in their knowledge, they soon came to deny His existence. They adored nature in the place of the God of nature. They glorified human genius, worshipped the works of their own hands, and taught their children to bow down to graven images. And under the shadow of the goodly trees, they set up the altars of their idols. Extensive groves that retained their foliage throughout the year were dedicated to the worship of false gods. With these groves were connected beautiful gardens, their long winding avenues overhung with fruit-bearing trees of all descriptions, adorned with statuary and furnished with all that could delight the senses or minister to the voluptuous desires of the people and thus allure them to participate in the idolatrous worship. The worshipers of false gods clothed their deities with human attributes and passions, and thus their standard of character was degraded to the likeness of sinful humanity. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. God had given men his commandments as a rule of life, but his law was transgressed, and every conceivable sin was the result. The wickedness of men was open and daring, justice was trampled in the dust, and the cries of the oppressed reached unto heaven. The world was in its infancy, yet iniquity had become so deep and widespread that God could no longer bear with it, and he said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. He declared that his spirit should not always strive with the guilty race. If they did not cease to pollute with their sins the world and its rich treasures, he would blot them from his creation and would destroy the things with which he had delighted to bless them. He would sweep away the beasts of the field and the vegetation which furnished such an abundant supply of food and would transform their fair earth into one vast scene of desolation and ruin. A hundred twenty years before the flood, the Lord by a holy angel declared to Noah his purpose and directed him to build an ark. While building the ark, he was to preach that God would bring a flood of water upon the earth to destroy the wicked. Those who would believe the message and would prepare for that event by repentance and reformation should find pardon and be saved. God gave Noah the exact dimensions of the ark and explicit directions in regard to its construction in every particular. Human wisdom could not have devised a structure of so great strength and durability. God was the designer and Noah the master builder. It was three stories high with but one door which was in the side. The light was admitted at the top and the different apartments were so arranged that all were lighted. The material employed in the construction of the ark was the cypress or gopher wood which would be untouched by decay for hundreds of years. 
The building of this immense structure was a slow and laborious process, yet the ark itself could not have withstood the storm which was about to come upon the earth. God alone could preserve his servants upon the tempestuous waters. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. While Noah was giving his warning message to the world, his works testified of his sincerity. It was thus that his faith was perfected and made evident. He gave the world an example of believing just what God says. All that he possessed, he invested in the ark. As he constructed that immense boat on dry ground, multitudes came from every direction to see the strange sight and to hear the earnest, fervent words of the singular preacher. Every blow struck upon the ark was a witness to the people. Yet, they did not turn to God with true repentance. They were unwilling to renounce their sins. During the time that elapsed before the coming of the flood, their faith was tested, and they failed to endure the trial. Overcome by the prevailing unbelief, they finally joined their former associates in rejecting the solemn message. Some were deeply convicted and would have heeded the words of warning, but there were so many to jest and ridicule that they partook of the same spirit. The men of that generation were not all, in the fullest acceptance of the term, idolaters. Many professed to be worshipers of God. They claimed that their idols were representations of the deity, and that through them, the people could obtain a clearer conception of the divine being. As they endeavored to represent God by material objects, their minds were blinded to His majesty and power. They ceased to realize the holiness of His character, or the sacred, unchanging nature of his requirements. As sin became general, it appeared less and less sinful, and they finally declared that the divine law was no longer in force, that it was contrary to the character of God to punish transgression, and they denied that his judgments were to be visited upon the earth. Had the men of that generation obeyed the divine law, they would have recognized the voice of God in the warning of his servant. But their minds had become so blinded by rejection of light that they really believed Noah's message to be a delusion. It was not multitudes or majorities that were on the side of right. The world was arrayed against God's justice and his laws, and Noah was regarded as a fanatic. The world made merry at the folly of the deluded old man Instead of humbling the heart before God, they continued their disobedience and wickedness, the same as though God had not spoken to them through his servant. But Noah stood like a rock amid the tempest. Surrounded by popular contempt and ridicule, he distinguished himself by his holy integrity and unwavering faithfulness. A power attended his words. Connection with God made him strong in the strength of infinite power while for 120 years his solemn voice fell upon the ears of that generation in regard to events which, so far as human wisdom could judge, were impossible. The world before the flood reasoned that for centuries the laws of nature had been fixed. The recurring seasons had come in their order. Heretofore, rain had never fallen. The earth had been watered by a mist or dew. But by their obstinate resistance to the reproofs of conscience, that generation filled up the measure of their iniquity and became ripe for destruction. The period of their probation was about to expire. Noah had faithfully followed the instructions which he had received from God. The ark was finished in every part as the Lord had directed and was stored with food for man and beast. And now the servant of God made his last solemn appeal to the people. With an agony of desire that words cannot express, he entreated them to seek a refuge while it might be found. Beasts of every description, the fiercest as well as the most gentle, were seen coming from mountain and forest and quietly making their way toward the ark. A noise as of a rushing wind was heard, and lo, 
birds were flocking from all directions, their numbers darkening the heavens, and in perfect order, they passed to the ark. Animals obeyed the command of God, while men were disobedient. Guided by holy angels, they went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, and the clean beasts by sevens. The world looked on in wonder, some in fear. Philosophers were called on to account for the singular occurrence, but in vain. It was a mystery which they could not fathom. God commanded Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Noah's warnings had been rejected by the world, but his influence and example resulted in blessings to his family. As a reward for his faithfulness and integrity, God saved all the members of his family with him. Mercy had ceased its pleadings for the guilty race. The beasts of the field and the birds of the air had entered the place of refuge. Noah and his household were within the ark and the Lord shut him in. A flash of dazzling light is seen, and a cloud of glory more vivid than the lightning descends from heaven and hovers before the entrance of the ark. The massive door, which it was impossible for those within to close, was slowly swung to its place by unseen hands. Noah was shut in, and the rejectors of God's mercy were shut out. The seal of heaven was on that door. God had shut it, and God alone could open it. For seven days after Noah and his family entered the ark, there appeared no sign of the coming storm. But upon the eighth day, dark clouds overspread the heavens. There followed the muttering of thunder and the flash of lightning. Soon, large drops of rain began to fall. The world had never witnessed anything like this and the hearts of men were struck with fear. All were secretly inquiring, can it be that Noah was in the right and that the world is doomed to destruction? Darker and darker grew the heavens, and faster came the falling rain. The beasts were roaming about in wildest terror, and their discordant cries seemed to moan out their destiny and the fate of man. Then the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Water appeared to come from the clouds in mighty cataracts. Rivers broke away from their boundaries and overflowed the valleys. Jets of water burst from the earth with indescribable force, throwing massive rocks hundreds of feet into the air. And these, in falling, buried themselves deep in the ground. The altars on which human sacrifices had been offered were torn down, and the worshipers were made to tremble at the power of the living God and to know that it was their corruption and idolatry which had called down their destruction. As the violence of the storm increased, trees, buildings, rocks, and earth were hurled in every direction. The terror of man and beast was beyond description. Above the roar of the tempest was heard the wailing of a people that had despised the authority of God. Others were frantic with fear, stretching their hands toward the ark and pleading for admittance. But their entreaties were in vain. Conscience was at last aroused to know that there is a God who ruleth in the heavens. Some, in their desperation, endeavored to break into the ark. But the firm-made structure withstood their efforts. Some clung to the ark until they were borne away by the surging waters, or their hold was broken by collision with rocks and trees. The massive ark trembled in every fiber as it was beaten by the merciless winds and flung from billow to billow. The cries of the beasts within expressed their fear and pain. But amid the warring elements, it continued to ride safely. Some of the people bound their children and themselves upon powerful animals, knowing that these were tenacious of life and would climb to the highest points to escape the rising waters. Some fastened themselves to lofty trees on the summit of hills or mountains. One spot after another that promised safety was abandoned.
waters rose higher and higher, the people fled for refuge to the loftiest mountains. Often, man and beast would struggle together for a foothold until both were swept away. From the highest peaks, men looked abroad upon a shoreless ocean. The solemn warnings of God's servant no longer seemed a subject for ridicule and scorning. How those doomed sinners longed for the opportunities which they had slighted. How they pleaded for one hour's probation, one more privilege of mercy, one call from the lips of Noah. But the sweet voice of mercy was no more to be heard by them. Love, no less than justice, demanded that God's judgments should put a check on sin. The avenging waters swept over the last retreat and the despisers of God perished in the black depths. By the word of God, the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished, but the heavens and earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Another storm is coming, and sin and sinners will be destroyed. God is love, yet there's a limit as to how long he will endure evil. So we see that God sent a flood of water to wash away the evil of that age. But one question remains, could a worldwide catastrophe occur and not leave behind some evidence that it actually happened? The global flood is more than just a story written in a book. It's written in the earth itself. And these physical evidences remain as a witness and a warning to us. So now let's take some time to investigate the judgment. One of the most unique and beautiful features of the Grand Canyon are the various different colored sedimentary layers that run along the canyon walls for miles. These layers are made up of sandstone and limestone and that's what creates that rainbow in the rocks. It's one of the things that makes the Grand Canyon so awesome to look at. But not only are these layers unique to the Grand Canyon, they give us our greatest clue on how the canyon was formed. The rock layers that we see uh, everywhere on the earth are, are, in, are generally in layers. The sedimentary rocks are almost all deposited by water. We see the rock layers consist of turbidites, washed in material, and with the catastrophism that was going on, you would have turbiditic action and the washing in of material. So water brings mud or sand, uh, or even coarser materials, uh, carries it and deposits it in a layer. That's typically how the, 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 the rocks in the geologic column form. Uh, and then they are different kinds of sediments, so they end up making rocks that look very different, right on top of each other. But there's the question of this one layer formed, and then how much time passed until the next layer came on top of it. The commonly held belief is that over millions of years, an ocean advanced over the entire continent and deposited a sedimentary layer and then retreated, leaving the ground dry once again. In this dry period, lasting tens of millions of years, this sediment would have been exposed to weathering and erosion. And if it just sits there without uh, being covered up fairly quickly, then, you, then a lot of things happen. Plants grow on it, roots go down through it, animals burrow through it. Flowing water will carve channels and you know gullies through it. And so it doesn't just stay undisturbed. 
Tens of millions of years of weathering and erosion would create an enormous amount of uneven terrain between these two layers, such as hills and valleys, but this is not what we see. There's little variation between these layers. They're extremely flat. And these time spans that supposedly occurred between two layers can be 10 million years, it can be 15 million, they can be up to 150 million years, like you see in one place in the Grand Canyon, in deposits in the Grand Canyon. You'd expect a, a lot of uh, erosion then, in fact, so much erosion that the whole record should be gone a long time ago. Average rates of erosion are about 61 millimeters per thousand years. With the same rate of erosion of 61 millimeters per thousand years, we should not be looking for 300 feet of erosion, not 3,000 feet of erosion, but 30,020 feet of erosion over a period of 150 million years. All the sedimentary layers in the Grand Canyon combined should have eroded six times over, and yet these layers are flat, telling us that these layers were deposited rapidly in quick succession. So is it realistic to think that 150 million years passed and, and nothing happened to this layer? It was not eroded out into to, uh, serious gullies. And it looks much more likely that there wasn't that time in between those different layers. The weather is always changing and the surface of the earth is always changing with it. Thunderstorms, floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, and wind, among other factors, are always changing and sculpturing the surface of our planet. These elements are always depositing sediment or eroding sediment, resulting in irregular surfaces. If you have time, then you're going to have change. So when we look at the contact points between these layers of sediment and see no evidence of erosion and no evidence of deposition, this idea that millions of years went by and nothing happened to the surface, it just doesn't add up. These are turbidite layers, often graded coarse to fine, which defies uniformitarian principles. It had to be rapid deposition. When you have a gap of 100 million years, you know, you have a couple miles of erosion. Uh, you had to look at the gap and it's flat. If it had taken a lot of time, you should have irregular erosion at the gaps. So the, the erosional feature is, is saying, oh, hey, short time, not long time. The flatness of the layers and so on tells you about a past that's entirely different. And this is the kind of data that you'd expect from the Genesis flood. Millions of years worth of erosion is missing because it was never there. This is what the rocks are telling us. But erosion is not the only thing missing. In fact, entire layers of sediment representing tens of millions of years are also missing. Here in the Grand Canyon, you can see right behind me this light-colored rock that's Coconino sandstone. It's sandwiched right on top of this darker color here. It's called Hermit Shale. There's a layer of sediment missing between the Coconino sandstone and the Hermit Shale called the Schneebly Hill Formation. Here we can see the lighter-colored Coconino sandstone, and sitting beneath that is the Schneebly Hill Formation that was missing from the Grand Canyon. Beneath the Schneebly Hill Formation is the Hermit Shale, though somewhat obscured by the vegetation in the valley. This is the Schneebly Hill Formation. It's more than 800 feet of rock, which is said to represent about six million years. And the problem that science has is that it cannot just remove that rock layer because in the mind of the modern geologist, each rock layer is associated with time. So removing a rock layer means you've removed a block of time. So the solution to them would be, well, the bottom layers form, the missing ones must have been there because the time was there, but here in this area there must have been a period of erosion that took them away to the previous layer thus not leaving a trace, and then the next one was deposited on top. The problem with that 
is that the contact is absolutely flat, like one glass sheet on top of another one, leaving no evidence of those erosional features which would show deep leaching, washout, any one of those scenarios, they're not there. Why are they a challenge to the long geologic ages? Because there is no erosion there. The Schnebley Hill Formation is missing from between these two layers, and there's no evidence of any erosion. This tells us that there was little or no time between the formation of these layers, and that they were deposited rapidly in a catastrophic event. This is why the Schnebley Hill Formation is missing in between these layers in the Grand Canyon, and is seen yet in another location only 90 miles away. So the Grand Canyon is a beautiful geological example of catastrophism and uh, defies modern theories as to how these unconformities came about. Here is the red wall limestone sitting on top of the mauve limestone. Between these two layers, we should see the Temple Butte Formation representing up to 155 million years of time. Instead, it's completely missing. There's no evidence of the 5.8 miles of erosion we would expect to see over this period of time. There's no evidence of erosion, no evidence of deposition, just a flat contact. But you can't have an area of 30 or 40, 50,000 square kilometers that have a flat surface that sits there for 100 million years. 100 million years after all is enough time to erode North America down from from its current elevation to base level to sea level six, seven times. And here the contact between the red wall limestone and the mauve limestone is flat, telling us that there was little or no passage of time between their formation. The 150 million years missing from between these two layers does not conform to the geological column. And for this reason, a sign has been placed here by the Park Service, marking it as yet another unconformity. We've looked at just a few of these unconformities, and in each instance, there was no erosion or deposition taking place in the supposed periods of millions of years. These are serious problems for evolutionists, but they pale in comparison to what is called the Great Unconformity, a gap of over a billion years of missing time. And guess what? The contact between these two layers is flat, just like the others. It is interesting, as we go down to the level of the Colorado River, uh, we, we find what we call the Precambrian. Uh, the volcanic material sits there, and it's pretty rough and pretty jumbled. And then the Cambrian sediments that come in over that lay over that, and then now they become very non-jumbled uh, layer after layer. I became keenly aware of that great unconformity that lies between the Precambrian and the Cambrian there in the Grand Canyon. You, you can't miss it, it's, it's with you all the time. The Great Unconformity in the Grand Canyon represents 1.2 billion years of time that is missing between the Precambrian and the Cambrian layers. Over this amount of time, we should see up to 45 miles of uneven erosion. That's nearly enough erosion to erode away the entire 25 miles of the Earth's crust twice Yet the Cambrian sits flat on top of the Precambrian layer. And once again, the contact point between these two layers is horizontal, telling us that the deposition of these layers is not the work of 1.2 billion years of erosion, but empirical evidence for a widespread water-based catastrophe that occurred rapidly in a short period of time. Then you come to the Cambrian layer and all of a sudden things change dramatically. Most of your animal phyla appear all of a sudden in that Cambrian layer. Not only isolated species, but whole phyla appear suddenly. Now that's mind boggling. If you take a phylum, I and mean, that's a huge category of creatures, a phylum mollusca, for example, is every single snail and slug down to squids and octopi and all the creatures uh, that belong to this group. And they all appeared simultaneously. 
at the same time. That doesn't leave much room for slow evolutionary processes. This is a double problem for evolution here that we have. And, what, and evolutionists are aware of this, and they call this the Cambrian Explosion. The Cambrian Explosion is the period referred to in the Cambrian layers where animals appear fully formed in the fossil record. These fully formed fossils consist of the data we observe. Since the Precambrian layer does not contain fossils of animal phyla or intermediary species, this leaves the concept of origins from interconnected evolutionary steps ever to exist in the realm of theory. So what does that talk about? Does that, is that about evolution? Hardly. It's about creation. This Precambrian layer often called the basement rock, only contains fossils of single-celled organisms and some soft-bodied creatures such as worms or jellyfish. This fits the biblical record because before the flood, there was no severe weather patterns or large catastrophes to bury and fossilize larger animals. The Cambrian layer, however, right above it, is the first sedimentary layer deposited by the flood. And this is why in it we see whole phyla of animals appearing suddenly and fully formed. There are no traces of intermediary species or slow evolutionary processes because no such things ever occurred. These sedimentary layers in the Grand Canyon are not evidence for evolution. They are unbiased testimonies of a catastrophic flood. And when we look at the size of these deposits, they tell us that this catastrophic flood was a global event. The Grand Canyon is there and, and you can see the layers on the side of it, but all those layers go hundreds of miles up through Arizona and Utah and Wyoming and, and Montana and even into Canada, the same layers. The Tapete Sandstone at the bottom of the Grand Canyon was the first layer deposited by the flood. It spans all the way from Mexico up across North America and even into Greenland. The Morrison Formation covers 400,000 square miles from New Mexico to Canada, and the St. Peter Sandstone covered approximately 500,000 square miles. When I thought about looking at those layers the way they are, they're all flat, there are no cuts between them. Not only are the layers themselves laid down rapidly, but there's not millions of years between them for erosion. The lack of erosion between the sedimentary layers in the Grand Canyon shows they were deposited rapidly in a catastrophe. But the fact that these layers extend for hundreds of miles, spanning several states and even up into Canada, shows the scale of the catastrophe was much larger than anything the world has witnessed in modern times. In terms of worldwide flood evidence, uh, we, we look at the sediments and uh, looking at the structure of the sediments, the fossils that are found in the sediments and whatnot, we, we uh, have what we call the, the geologic column. And we find the, the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian, the Devonian, uh, the Carboniferous and the Permian. Those are just some of the, some of the major structures that we see. We can find those in the United States. We can go over to Europe, and guess what? We find the same sequences. We go to Asia, we find the same sequences. We go to Australia, we find the same sequences. Not only do we find the same sequences in structure and content, but also the fossil content. To me, this says something had to happen worldwide, if not simultaneously, awfully close to simultaneously, to, for all of this to happen and all of, the, all of the sedimentary structures to come down. I try to focus on those things in the record that make us aware of the global aspect of the flood. Uh, for example, what we call the Cretaceous chalks that are found all over the world. When a chalk layer is deposited in water, and it's the uh, calcium carbonate skeletons of foraminifera, marine organisms, and you have 
masses of these creatures. And you have this layer, and it spreads continent-wide to continent to continent. And it can only be deposited underwater. And therefore, the whole world must have been underwater at the same time. This is such compelling evidence for a universal flood that uh, you have to really, really stretch the imagination to make it a periodic incursion or regression. And those are just one of the kinds of deposits that tell us you had uh, things happening on a worldwide scale because you have chalk in a number of parts of the world all at the very same place in the geologic record. We will find that they sit on a iron containing sand that we call glauconitic sandstone. And we will find the glauconitic sandstone in England. We can find the same structures here in the United States, in Alabama, and, and that area. We can find them in Australia. And guess what? They're all sitting on glauconitic sandstones. They all have the same types of fossils. The whole business, it's, it's there. But it's evidence that the, there was um, continuity across the world. I'm here at the south rim of the Grand Canyon at an elevation of 7,200 feet above sea level. I'm currently standing on what is called the Kayabob Limestone Formation. This sedimentary rock is found all over Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and even as far away as the state of California. And it's teeming with marine fossils. The fact that you find fossils here tell us that this layer had to be laid down rapidly in order for fossilization to occur. There are certain kinds of limestone formation, characteristic limestone formations you find in the Grand Canyon and other areas in the Paleozoic. And you find those in Europe and in, and in Asia and other parts of the world. You find uh, these, these limestones very typical being world, global in their distribution. As you go up the record, there are things that are characteristic here that are around the world. You go up a little higher, you have different things that are characteristic around the world. You go up a little higher and you have other features of, of the rocks that are characteristic around the world. And, and we could go on. And there are many examples of this. And so why are those things so, so global? I think it's best explained by, by a global catastrophe. The widespread distribution of chalk and other sedimentary layers is consistent with what we would expect to see in a worldwide catastrophe. But the fossils themselves, which is often thought to be evidence for evolution, are in reality further evidence for the Genesis flood story. Finding the same fossils in the same layers worldwide, to me, is another strong salient point that there was a global flood, a global phenomenon. And when we look at the fossil record, we will find smaller, less complex fossils at the bottom. And as we traverse up the geologic column, we will find larger and larger uh, complexity. And this has led many people to believe that there is an evolutionary progression from simple to complex in the fossil record. Actually, there's no such thing. There's no such thing as a simple animal. Every animal, every creature ever found is highly complex. And a lot of people talk about those as the first appearances of life. I would like to propose that we're looking not as a record of life, but as a record of death. It's the first appearance of the preservation of things that are dying. We have this complex aqueous destruction, the flood, occurring. And as these sediments are settling, they are also settling and, and trapping the life forms as they die. Simple to more complex to more complex. Obviously, if you're going to cover an environment with a turbidite, that which lives at the bottom will be buried at the bottom. That which swims at a higher level will be buried at a higher level. That which is on the top will be found on the top. And this is exactly what we find. You find fish that are fossilized in their position of swim, sometimes with food in their mouth. That's instantaneous. Fossils are only created when they're rapidly buried. In order to have rapid burial, you need to have a catastrophe. A mudslide from heavy rain or a flood can cause such a condition. 
The fact that there's so many fossils found all over the world and in the same layers is evidence of rapid burial on a global scale. Another strong giveaway that this was the result of a global flood is the fact that many of these animals have been washed together by strong currents into what is called fossil graveyards. Fossil graveyards are something that most people probably aren't familiar with. It's the idea that you have a mass mortality. That means a large number of animals uh, were destroyed and buried pretty much at the same time. And probably the most popular of these types of deposits are the dinosaurs. But there are areas of concentration which have always made me wonder, let's look at what the sediments were doing. Maybe this is a low area and these things were being washed in and deposited in kind of little low areas and concentrated in that way by waters that were moving these bodies. We find things like this all over the globe. For example, there are layers in central Utah where there are brachiopods. Brachiopods are like clams. There are, I don't know, billions of these organisms that make up these layers. That's a fossil graveyard. It's it's unconscionably high count of fossils. I'm working on a on a bone bed in, in Wyoming right now where we have the remains of 10,000 or more dinosaurs. It certainly speaks of catastrophe. You don't get bone beds formed without catastrophes. We found out in our, in our deposit, at least, that the bones are not uh, as we would expect them to be if a bunch of animals had died over a period of time. Instead, the, the bones are all disarticulated and they're sorted according to the size. So we have big bones at the bottom and little bones on top. And the only way you could get that to happen is if you transported the whole mass of bones as a debris flow uh, very rapidly into deeper water and, and the bones sorted themselves as they traveled. If you take the Karoo Basin, I mean, it's, it's massive. And the dinosaurs and the creatures are orientated in the direction of stream flow. And the, the modern thinking would be, well, it would have had to be in river basins where these creatures were deposited, stretching over virtually the entire continent. That's some river, it doesn't happen today. You have to imagine such a totally different world in the past. There are so many things which point to a universal flood. The violent forces of the flood washed thousands of animals into large areas where they later became fossilized. However, under different conditions, the same plant and animal debris turned into coal. Coal is, is masses of plant material that have been deposited in a, in a unit and they've been sort of compacted and changed chemically into coal. Coal deposits can be very extensive. They can be very thick, up to 1,000 feet thick for individual bed. We find it in these very flat seams that have usually very sharp tops and bottoms to them and so on, which is not the way plants normally grow. This looks transported. Obviously, water deposited you find marine organisms in coal fields, which are terrestrial deposits. Uh, this belies any story that would contradict the biblical scenario. We find massive amounts of coal. Uh, we have, over in Wyoming, we have millions and millions of tons of coal. In Australia, we have millions and millions of tons of coal. In Europe, we have in pencil, back in Pennsylvania and all these sorts of things. And they cover thousands of square miles. And you find the same kind of coal deposits, the same place in the geologic record, in, in widespread in Europe, going over into Russia, uh, and, and we could go on. The widespread distribution of these coal beds is global in nature. And irregardless of their location, these coal beds also appear in the same place in the geological column, which shows they were deposited at the same time. Therefore, logic necessitates the conclusion that the formation of these coal beds is the result of a water-based catastrophe that occurred globally about the same time. 
It's estimated that two to three feet of vegetation is required to form one foot of coal. Some coal beds are more than 100 feet thick, which would require more than two to 300 feet of vegetation while covering an area of tens of thousands of square miles. When scientists look at the amount of coal we have on Earth today, they realize there's no way all the vegetation on the planet could produce that amount of coal, and I agree. The difference is they believe the coal formed is millions of years worth of accumulated vegetation. But the Bible tells us that the earth before the flood was a lush green planet. It, it's not implausible to have this come from just the vegetation that existed just before the flood. Many scientists, for example, believe that the firmament in its construction allowed the earth to be under a little over two atmospheres of pressure. And these two atmospheres of pressure would engender significant growth. Where we now see vast deserts, mountain ranges, and frozen continents, there was once before the flood fertile land and vast forests unlike anything now seen. We find large amounts of oil in the deserts of the Middle East, a remnant of its former green landscape. And from drill cores in Antarctica, scientists have found the continent once was a tropical forest covered with palm trees. The vast forests buried in the earth at the time of the flood, which have now since changed to coal and oil, form the extensive deposits that we see today. These evidences are among many that testify of God's love for man in the creation of a beautiful, lush, green planet one that was destroyed by a global water-based catastrophe as recorded in the Bible. The flood is the, the event that harmonizes what we see in geology in terms of a recent creation by God, which was in just six days, a few thousand years ago, as described in the Bible. There's so much evidence we cannot possibly investigate it in such a short time. But if we step back and look at the big picture, the Earth itself is its own witness. We saw how the flat, horizontal, sedimentary layers in the Grand Canyon with no erosion between them testify to the fact that these layers were laid down rapidly and not over millions of years. We saw the size of this catastrophe had to be at least as large as some of the layers they formed, which are larger than some continents, affirming its global impact. We saw how hundreds of millions or even billions of years of expected deposition or erosion is completely missing between these sedimentary layers, showing that what we see does not conform to the evolutionary model. We saw in the first sedimentary layer containing animal fossils that they were found fully formed, not in incremental evolutionary steps. We see how the existence of fossils in these layers is evidence of rapid burial, as some fish fossils are found with food in their mouths or in positions of swim. We saw how massive fossil graveyards are strong evidence that thousands of dead animals, fish, mammals, and even birds were all washed together and deposited in lowlands where they were buried and fossilized. We saw how the massive coal and oil deposits found today could only be formed by compressed vegetation from a lush green earth that was destroyed and buried. We saw how the Cretaceous chalk layer formed by the flood covers every continent as one would expect from a global catastrophe. When we sit back and look at our planet, what do we see? The earth itself tells us it was once decimated by a global water-based catastrophe.
So why is it with a world full of evidence that the story of the flood as found in the Bible is rejected by some of the brightest minds in the scientific community in general? I'll give you a clue. It has little to do with the evidence. The Bible gives us an explanation of, of a history, that uh, the, the earth and life were created, were created perfect, and then it has changed because of sin. If that's true, why are so many scientists fully uh, opposed to that point of view? And the reason has more to do with worldview than it does with data. Leaving religious perspectives out of it doesn't solve that problem. Bias is not a religious problem, it's a human problem. No matter what we profess, whether we say I'm a Christian and I reject evolutionary biology, or I'm, a, I'm an evolutionist and I reject Christianity, or if I'm someplace in the middle muddling around here, nonetheless, everything that we do, everything that we see, everything we say and understand, the, our entire worldview, the way we formulate our concepts, our thoughts of what we see and know in the world around us, are are inalterably or unavoidably affected by these two views. And that worldview has a, has a very strong influence on what we notice, on the kind of questions we ask. If you restrict the number of interpretations that you can put on the data uh, with your worldview, then obviously that's going to restrict the kind of theories that you can come up with. So, uh, for example, if you're looking at, um, at the materialistic worldview uh, and uh, you're looking at these amazing molecular machines that I enjoy studying or the the information that's recorded in DNA uh, there are any number of theories that you come up with based on that data that you've collected but if you're a materialist none of your theories could suggest that a, an intelligent mind wrote that information in the DNA. That's a theory that's not allowed. Evolution belies the, the laws of physics. Everything moves from a higher to a lower grade. There's always a regression. There is never the reverse. That is the law of thermodynamics. And life defies the law of thermodynamics. So here you have a theory which basically violates every sim single physical law, and yet it is one of the basic theories which is even enshrined in legislation. That's mind-boggling. Science is defined as a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe. The problem evolution has is that it is not a testable explanation. Evolution necessitates that in some way, somehow, something that is not alive could by itself create something that is alive. This mysterious event has not been observed anywhere in nature or in the laboratory and therefore it does not pass the scientific method, so it cannot be established as scientific fact. All life consists of DNA, which is very complex organized information. The reason why natural processes cannot and will never produce life is because natural processes do not create or organize information. Organization requires intelligence, and where we see evidence of organization, we see evidence of God. Therefore, the most supreme revelation the study of science and the natural world can ever grant mankind is a discovery of the existence of the supernatural. In spite of this, the pride of human bias and man's commitment to a godless worldview still influences our courts and educational institutions, which, to this day, mandate by law, evolution be taught as an infallible fact. 
People have asked me uh, a question about why is it that science seems to be becoming more and more confident in their commitment to, to a, a completely evolutionary ex origin of life. Is that because we've got more data? Well, no, it really isn't. It's, it's, a, it's because there's becoming increasing confidence, increasing commitment to a worldview. And I think part of that is because of the political battles over what's going to be taught in public schools. When they, when they say that you have to teach that, then you are basically saying, in my personal opinion, that every teacher has to be a liar. Because he has to proclaim that which is a theory of modern science. When there are better theories to explain what we see, which are excluded, if they were to put them both before the students, as a matter of comparison and choice, that would be fair. But the way in which it is today belies comprehension. You don't talk about God in textbooks, science textbooks, scientific articles and so on. Uh, God is out of the picture. Uh, but what if God exists? Uh, this is no way to find truth. Uh, so that's how a worldview can constrict things. One of the things that I really appreciate about the uh, biblical worldview that Christians embrace is that it's liberating. We can't say that all reality is only what I can see mechanistically and so on. There's nothing to tell us that that's all to reality. I, I prefer a broader approach. Well, let's include God and the possibilities here and look at the scientific data. And the scientific data tends to point us towards God. When you say, well, no, I'm not going to get involved with religion or the Bible because that's not science, I think you're being unnecessarily restrictive and you are eliminating the possibility uh, of you investigating that which might be true. But science has a certain appeal to the independence of the human mind and heart. Science is the realm of the human. This is what we've done. This is what we know. Whereas religion, faith, Christianity, that's, that's the realm of God. I think the main impediment to accepting the biblical account of origins is the consequences of accepting it. Now, the problem of bringing God into the discussion is that it inevitably, it brings back in the question of moral accountability. And to say that, that uh, there is morality in an evolutionary uh, paradigm is to fool yourself. You can't have a supreme being and lower beings without defining that relationship somehow. And intuitively, we recognize that that's a moral law. And we may not look very good examined in that light. And so to escape the concept of judgment, to escape the concept of moral accountability, there's a natural tendency to want to forget the creator. And consequently, things like the story of the flood, the evidences that are still visible on the earth. These are things that maybe subconsciously at times, we're pretty happy to find an alternative explanation. We're, we're, we're comfortable moving away from the idea of moral accountability. Eliminating moral accountability meant rewriting the history of the world. And this is exactly what happened. A new worldview was adopted, in particular a worldview that did not include the history of the flood, thus trying to eliminate God's judgment and therefore any moral accountability. But how could such a dramatically different worldview catch on? Well, the perfect opportunity arose towards the end of the Dark Ages.
If we look at popular culture today, the flood story is not one that is commonly accepted. It's literally true. And so it's easy to look at it and say, nobody believes that. Well, that sort of begs the question a little bit, what about the last few thousand years? And the answer is, everybody believed it. Uh, in fact, the, the universal flood story has been noted time after time in, in cultures scattered around the world. Uh, every culture, it seems, has a story of a flood, and uh, they all drew some lessons from it. The lessons may vary here and there, but they believed it. So why don't we believe it now? Students will sometimes ask me, how, how did science come to the point of view that they have now that denies miracles and are passionately uh, unwilling to believe in creation? And you have to go through a little history to explain that. Our society has been subjected to a whole fabric of intellectual ideas set to undermine the history of the flood, the history of the world, the history of creation. The entire surface of the Earth had been changed by a water-based catastrophe, and this overwhelming evidence can't be erased or removed, so in the minds of those that rejected the flood story, it needed to be reinterpreted. And this is how it happened. Uh, all during the Middle Ages, um, some factors in, in society were very um, autocratic, and dogmatic and uh, persecuting people, making life very hard for people, suppressing them. And, and what were those agencies that were doing that? Well, it was governments and the church. One of the greatest things that man wants to have over man is power. In the Middle Ages, the church ruled the world. So during the Dark Ages, the medieval time period, for 1,500 years, you had this nearly monolithic, universal, well, throughout Europe anyhow, uh, rule of the Catholic Church. One of the arenas of conflict in the developing new freedom of thought with the existing structures of the, of the Catholic Church over the last 1500 years was, of course, the area of science. And the stories are, are fairly well known of, of all these scientists from Galileo to Newton to, to uh, Copernicus to uh, Francis Bacon who came into conflict with the church. Probably Galileo is the one that is, is most famous. He pr promoted the, the heliocentric or the, the sun at the center and all the little planets going around. But the church didn't like that for a variety of philosophical reasons. To have the, the earth at the center was important philosophically. That was a, a mark of the, the perfection of God's creation. And, and to have the idea kicked around that, that the earth wasn't where we thought it was and that these other planets weren't going in perfect circles, that just that wasn't popular. So Galileo was, was called up by the Inquisition, placed under house arrest, threatened with, threatened with serious punishment, possibly death. We use that story now, unfortunately, many times to create an unworkable antagonism between Christianity and science. And that's not what ought to be learned from that lesson. Because when we look at the teachings of the church through the Dark Ages, in many cases, it's not what the Bible says. The world had been subjected to a very rigid religious thinking. And anything that was slightly out of that tight box was regarded as contra truth, contra God, contra Bible, and had to be eradicated by force and by inquisition and by death penalty. And, and you came finally to a point in history where the people were tired of that. They were weary of it. The, the, the church was losing its credibility because of that, because of the way they had, had treated people. The governments, the people were tired of the way governments had treated them. And 
This led to a, a, a movement among scholars to move away from authority and from any of these autocratic agencies. And the view of God was one of this wrathful deity who was lurking in the woods just waiting for the transgressor to put a foot wrong. And the kings ruled not of love but out of greed, controlled not out of love but out of fear, including the church. In seeing the abuse of power that had prevailed over Europe, they utterly rejected the Catholic Church, which of course in their mind meant that they utterly rejected Christianity. And so that gave rise to a, a more atheistic-minded society. And the mindset of man says, well, what was the restricting force? The restricting force to any mind expansion was God. And therefore, let's get rid of him. Let's get rid of God so that we can grow intellectually. And that's what they did in the French Revolution. Instead of holding the masses in blind submission to her dogmas, Rome's work resulted in making them infidels and revolutionists. They regarded her greed and cruelty as the fruit of the Bible, and they would have none of it. Rome had misrepresented the character of God, and now men rejected both the Bible and its author. This led to the French Revolution, and ultimately, the complete removal of the church's power it had maintained over the people for more than a thousand years. In the French National Assembly, the mob of revolutionaries declared only reason should be worshipped. They revealed a beautiful woman adorned in blue drapery and proclaimed her the goddess of reason. And they enshrined the goddess of reason. And reason took the place of faith in God. They carried this woman on a car to Notre Dame destroyed the church, and preached atheism to the masses inside the church every week. The French people responded to the many centuries of Roman Catholic oppression and persecution by establishing a new form of government. Instead of a nation with a Christian worldview, howbeit perverted and ruled by the Catholic Church at the time, a society was formed with an atheistic worldview, absent of any Christian influence. And this was called the Age of Enlightenment. They didn't want to have anything else to do with God. They saw that God was tyrannical. People were forced to believe. And so now, let's remove God from the equation altogether. And uh, that's what happened in the French Revolution. We moved from a God-centered environment to a reason-based environment. Atheism arose, you know, tremendously in, in France. Look what happened in France. The Bible was burnt, was destroyed, and that's called the Age of Enlightenment. And so we see this idea of enlightenment totally removing God from the picture. Out of all the segments of French society, it was the Catholic priests who suffered the highest per capita mortality rate. There was a lot of animosity, and they took it out on the church. And in most cases, that means they took it out on Christianity. In an effort to defend science and reason as the new ideals for society, the atheistic endeavor went about to de-Christianize France in what became known as the Reign of Terror. Priests were imprisoned or executed. Churches and religious monuments were vandalized or destroyed. The word saint was removed from street signs. The worship of a deity was forbidden. Bibles were burned publicly, and the rallying cry of the French infidels was, crush the wretch, referring to Christ in the form of his church. Christians became the objects of public hatred. Many were shot dead while on their knees in prayer, and their bodies left where they fell at their places of worship. In the forests where Christians gathered, bodies hung from trees and scattered the ground everywhere. All this was the result of the atheistic movement called the Great Enlightenment, and those who thought to dethrone the Catholic Church for its centuries of torture and bloodshed were now themselves guilty of the same crimes. The culminating events coming out of the Enlightenment and then up to the, the French Revolution, which seemed to indicate the death of Christianity. All this was as Satan would have it. His policy is deception, and his purpose is to bring wretchedness upon men. 
to deface the workmanship of God, to mar the divine purpose of love, and to thus cause grief in heaven. Then, by his deceptive arts, he leads men to throw the blame on God, as if all this misery were the result of the Creator's plan. When the people found Romanism to be a deception, he urged them to regard all religion as a cheat and the Bible as a fable. The papacy w was, was, looked like it was going to die. Society was freed to consider a different alternative, let's put it that way. This age of enlightenment, this free thinking, actually was the beginning of what I would call modern science. This movement away from, from authority, really we, we think of it in terms of the, time, the period of time called the Enlightenment. You, you don't have this bridle on you and you can begin to explore and you can begin to look and you can begin to use human reason. People were in fact moving away from their confidence in governments and in the church and wanting to think for themselves and uh, and bring out more human freedom. And this freedom went many different directions, including uh, moving away from belief in God. If it hadn't been for the French Revolution and the mindset that God is not involved in the process, reason takes the place of God, then there wouldn't have been a fertile soil for the development of evolutionary thinking. The new generation, if you wish, of, of earth science individuals, most notably Lyell and Darwin, came to the fore in the 1800s. Charles Lyell was a geologist who for the first time introduced the concept of long periods of time uh, in the development of geological features. And then he wrote this work, The Principles of Geology. These geological views Lyle espoused in his book became known as uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is the belief that things as they unfold and happen today were no different from what they were in the past. So if something takes a very long time to develop today, it must have taken a very long time in the past. Uniformitarianism is the basis for believing in the millions of years of time so critical to the theory of evolution. The widespread acceptance of the principle behind uniformitarianism was foretold in the Bible to be one of the prevailing reasons why people at the end of time would deny both creation and the global flood. There shall come a time in the last days, scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. This is what uniformitarianism teaches, that all things have continued at the same rate since the beginning. But what if there's a catastrophe? What if you have a major storm and all of the material that uniformitarianism said would eventually disappear, disappear just like that? And that's what we see. The view that things have remained the same since the beginning of creation is a philosophy God warned would characterize a belief system in the last days. And this mindset, we're told, would lead people to be willingly ignorant of the fact that the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. The prophecy says they will be willingly ignorant meaning they'll be unwilling to consider any evidence for the flood. And this is exactly how Charles Lyell described his own views. Lyell wrote regarding fossils saying, we cannot account for their present position by the universal deluge. I hold an utter abomination most learned academicians. Those systems which are built with their foundations in the air and cannot be propped up without a miracle. As a naturalist, Charles Lyell rejected all miracles as an explanation but it was not his observations in science that led him to this conclusion. It was his commitment to his own worldview. He revealed his bias against the biblical flood story when, in a letter he wrote, these views of geological ages will free science from Moses. These ideas then were passed from Charles Lyell.
to the young 22-year-old seminary student, Charles Darwin. When Charles Darwin was commissioned to travel on the Beagle, one of the books he took with him was Charles Lyell's book on principles of geology. And here he was reading this information and he comes to the Galapagos Islands and he sees these finches and the finches are of such a broad variety. So the idea comes that obviously these finches must have evolved from a pair that happened to get to the islands and all the varieties evolved thereafter. And then these geological ideas fit in. This must have taken time. And Lyle's ideas start kicking in. He therefore says, if this variety that I see here developed over time and change took place by natural selection, then God did not create. Charles took the ideas about long ages of time that Lyle applied to geology and then applied them to biology. Then he had given biological evolution, something it didn't previously have, a scientific mechanism by which to operate. Darwin came up with this, the new theory, the, the natural selection, and that was kind of the magic bullet of the day. That's what gave plausibility that now we've found a mechanism that can account for this change over long periods of time. Darwin later became close friends with Lyle, and it's been said by some that he was the most influential person in Darwin's life. Darwin commented on Lyle's view about the flood and said, Lyle is most firmly convinced that he has shaken the faith in the deluge far more efficiently by never having said a word against the Bible than if he had acted otherwise. In, in the middle of the, of the 19th century, things started changing. Towards the end of that century, uh, the scientific community started excluding God from its interpretations. Now, God has been expelled from the uh, explanatory menu of the scientific community. The theory of evolution has become the foundation of our global society today, and the catastrophic results of such a belief can be seen everywhere in the denial of moral accountability, in the denial of God, and therefore the denial of the flood. But perhaps more than any other belief, evolution has pushed our society closer to the magnitude of the wickedness that existed in the days of Noah. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Wickedness and evil is how God defined the thoughts of man before the flood. This is all the more applicable to us when we consider what the Bible has to say about the thoughts of the wicked. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. When the Bible says that God is not in all his thoughts, what is really being said is God is not in any of his thoughts. The wickedness that was great in the earth in the days of Noah was a godless society that did not seek after him nor think of him. With this in mind, we can see a direct fulfillment in Jesus' prophecy that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. getting to the point in this world today where God is being so marginalized even in political systems and laws that are being made that for all intents and purposes he's being written out of human existence and human psyche. So we're at the same point today. Uh, some of the things that were happening before the flood in particular uh, the Bible tells us that the land was full of violence and uh, people evidently were not only guilty of committing violence, it sounds like they were entertained by violence, which is something that's going on in the world today. And a lot of uh, sophisticated and uh, kind people would uh, just be shocked at the idea they would be guilty of murder, but they don't think twice about being entertained by watching other people commit murder. Same thing with uh, the law of uh, adultery people who say, I would never commit adultery, but uh, they're entertained by watching. And the Bible talks about it's not just those that do them, but those that have pleasure in those that do them. 
the do whatever you please mindset is what we have with us today. The loss of integrity of the Word of God began in the late 1700s and into the 1800s. Uh, the rise of evolution took away the, the sense of, of God as our Creator, that we have a Creator, that we have a personal God, and that there is judgment. If you believe in evolution, it's absurd to believe in a judgment. But if we do not believe that God had uh, the flood in the beginning, why am I going to believe that he's going to destroy the world by fire? Doesn't make sense. So if I can get you to deny the flood, then basically I've got a leg up on you in denying the eternal uh, destruction of the, of the world as we know it. As our global culture moves away from the idea of moral absolutes and our culture shuns the need for a standard of morality, we see suffering, crime, and misery increasing proportionally until life itself is not respected. As things continue to get worse in our world, it becomes all the more apparent why a judgment of justice is necessary and why it was necessary in the days of Noah. Evil had perpetuated itself to such an extent that there was no solution anymore. It would have continued at that rate forever and ever and ever, which would mean a universe of eternal misery. Who, who would want to live in a universe like that for all eternity? Uh, if you look at uh, parents at their children's graves and the agony and the pain that is associated with that, there must be a judgment. And so God set a limit. And before all mankind should have been engulfed in this and no witness remain to the love of God and the original intent of creation to live in peace and harmony and love together with God, then there would have been nothing left to continue the story about the love of God. So God had to intervene. God is loving, God is patient. But as he told uh, Moses, uh, while he is long-suffering and abounding in forgiveness and mercy, he will by no means clear the guilty that there is a time of judgment. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. It tells us that there were a hundred and twenty years of warning and pleading. Judgment does not come out of the blue, although those who have chosen to ignore all the warnings for 120 years in Noah's case may think it did. Um, judgment is always, always has been tempered with mercy, but mercy does not make judgment avoidable. There comes a time when the rain will fall. And he destroyed this world with a flood. And this destruction stands as a guarantee for another judgment that must come later on. Now the Bible says that the later judgment will be by fire. It will not come by flood again. There might be intermittent floods, but the final judgment will come by fire. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The world was baptized by water in the days of Noah. Second Peter 3 says it will be baptized by fire when the Lord returns. And then he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. So the earth is born again, you might say, after it goes through this water baptism from Noah's time. But he protected Noah and his family. It's going to be baptized with fire at the second coming, but he will once again protect his people. So the same message that we have here in the Genesis account must be preached at the end of time as well. At the end of time, the days of Noah will be repeated, and the rocks and the fossils of the earth bear witness to this fact. Like the story of Genesis, the earth itself is both a record and a prophecy, warning us of another judgment still to come. But when? 
At the end of time, there are three warnings given to man that immediately precede the second coming of Christ. These warnings are given by three angels and have become known as the three angels' messages. In the days of Noah, when the message of judgment was being given, was the world's first judgment hour. And now, at the end of time, the first angel's message echoes Noah's warning by announcing the hour of his judgment is come. In part two of the days of Noah, we will investigate these messages and even discover the very year when this judgment hour announcement is made and when the days of Noah for the last generation will begin. The story of the ark basically parallels the three angels' messages. The three angels' messages of Revelation 14 are God's last message to the world. It is an end time message, and it is a message that actually prepares the world for the coming of Christ. Noah followed God's instructions in the preparation of the ark, and we will see how the three angels' messages point us back to an ancient structure of God's design that reveals the instructions God's people are to follow in preparation for his second coming at the end of time. The, the first angel's message points us to truth. The second angel's message points us to the counterfeit. And the third angel's message says choose. And Noah called the people to a choice, you know, choose. Make your decision, but know that these decisions are final. An hour of judgment is coming. People are being warned in advance because God loves man and wants to save them. And God will once again see the wickedness of man and say that the thoughts of his heart and mind are only evil continually. And he will once again bring judgment. So it's a message of warning, it's a message of love, but it's an, a message also that there's impending judgment. I came into contact with biblical truth. I came into contact with a choice. I was an atheist, and prophecy told me there was a God. So I've had to make choices, and choices cost you. When I made the choice no longer to believe in evolution, but to preach creation, it had consequences because I was a zoologist and I was in a secular university in a zoology department. So the consequence was that I resigned, no longer willing to compromise that which I now believe for the sake of financial gain. You know, there's some both encouraging and sobering things in the flood story for me. One is that um, you can't wait until a message is popular if it's the truth, you need to embrace it no matter what everyone else in the world does. Uh, someone once said that uh, a dumb idea is still a dumb idea even if a million people believe it. And even though Noah was in the minority, uh, it, it's clear today he was right. And God is looking for people who will stand up even though the truth is not popular. My, my Christian faith is not dependent on, on my science. Yet, one can't help wondering if, if the two shouldn't coincide. If God is the author of both, then uh, why shouldn't the, the natural world coincide with the biblical account? I'm looking to see if we can't do good science and make breakthroughs in, in our understanding of the world around us by using the Bible as a, as a starting point. So it has encouraged me. It has, it has uh, certainly develop confidence in God's Word, uh, and I, for that I'm grateful. <laughs> 